Welcome to our month-long series on municipal councils here in Canada. That's right, 15 episodes. We're going to be sitting down in the month of October to talk with councillors, mayors, Reeves from all across Canada to talk about them, their duty to serve, but also their communities. And we couldn't have asked for a better guest to start this month-long series off with. She is the town of Okotoks counselor, and she has graciously accepted our first position on the show to do this. And that is Okotoks town counselor, Rachel Swenseed. I I had to make sure I said that correctly. <laughs> counselor, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I love my community and I love talking politics. So this is a perfect opportunity. <laughs> Two for the price of one. Well, yeah. uh, Counselor, I'm going to get this party started with the question I've asked every single type of politician who's ever come on this show, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? That is, I love that question. I, and I knew you were going to ask that question because I've listened to your other podcasts before. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about, am I going to, you know, talk about why I actually entered politics? And the reason I entered politics was because um, I love my community and I've seen how policy changes people's lives. That's why I entered politics. But I think like the deeper question of my duty to serve came from, I, you know, I think it was actually my, my parents, my, my family, my mom and dad, they immigrated from the Czech Republic um, in the early 80s to escape communism. And my life growing up was basically no complaining. Like if I was to complain about something, I would like, I would get in trouble. And so my, my parents instilled kind of this deep gratitude for the community we lived in, for the country that we lived in, for the services that are here. And so through that, I think that's carried me into realizing that, um, yeah, a policy changes people's lives. And if you have an opportunity to be part of that policy that can help folks, I feel like you almost don't have an obligation, but I really felt that duty, right? I felt that duty that I needed to give back to, again, the, the community, to the country that um, has provided so much for my family. So I think, yeah, that that's gonna that's my answer there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and it launches into a long line of other questions. Now I have to follow up. That is, you can give back uh, to your community in many different ways, whether it be through nonprofits, whether it be through business, whether it be through volunteerism. You chose the political route. You chose, uh, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I try to let my guests do all the talking here. Mm -hmm. um, you chose last term to run for town council in Okotoks. Uh, what was the decision behind that? And what was the decision behind giving back politically instead of whether it be volunteerism or uh, nonprofits? So what ended up happening, so I've kind of volunteered, I guess, my whole life when I was here in Okotoks, I went away to university. Then I moved back to Okotoks and I started a or co-founded a nonprofit that works with Foothills families um, and we provide baby items for them. Now, through this, starting this nonprofit and kind of, you know, watching this nonprofit unfold in that process, I saw that the people that we were serving were really impacted by policies. Right. And so um, when we talked to them about providing them things like diapers or formula or clothing, I would ask, you know, how is everything going? What else is happening in your life? Do you need other support? And they would tell me, you know, what was going on. And I would I was really seeing gaps like affordable housing. Right. Things like transit. Um, I so that was the first time I'm like, you know what, we're doing a great job as a nonprofit, really great job. Um, but there are gaps that we cannot fill and the people to fill it are the policymakers. And then I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go in it. And the second thing that really spurred me was actually the pandemic was I saw in Okotoks and actually throughout Alberta that the folks that kind of carried communities that kept things moving were folks that um, maybe were being underserved. Right. And so I realized that if the folks here in Okotoks that are, you know, again, keeping our community moving, if they're not provided the services and the support that they require, that's a problem. And then I was like, that's and that's where policy comes into play. And so that it kind of, that's how it all married. Yeah, together. Um, we are we are going to be talking about some policies later on in the episode, but I, I still want to focus in on you. Um, 
I, I always find it interesting whenever I talk to uh, counselors or prospective candidates to be uh, a counselor or an elected official. You are one of the few people in Okotoks who've ever been able to serve as town councillor. I think you are in a rare breed of people in that community who have ever been able to sit in that council and make decisions for the day-to-day -day lives of the people of Okotoks. Um, after that election last year, one year ago, almost to the, uh, this month in October, you were elected as a first-term councillor. Take me through that election night. Were you on edge? Were you uh, apprehensive? Were you, I, I had some people tell me that they just didn't care. It was done. They were done with the walking, done with the door knocking. It was out of their hands now and it was someone else's hands. What was the feeling like for you that election night in 2021 when you were waiting for the results to come in? Wow, even asking that question gives me all the butterflies <laughs> back in my stomach again. Um, I was really nervous. I felt really good though to, at that point because I honestly felt I had given it my all. You know, I've knocked on as many doors as I could. I went to as many events as I could. I set up as many funny little tables at the dog park as I could. So I got to that point and I and I felt that, you know what, it's, it's in a voter's hands now. If they don't select me, democracy is beautiful and I'm just not selected, that's okay. Um, but I definitely felt nervous because it um, it was a big it was a big two months it was a long two months um, but uh, yeah I was excited and nervous. So when you when you got the results when you got the announcement that you are now the councillor elect for the town of Okotoks, that joy now probably turns to oh God the weight of the community is now on my shoulders and the decisions I make are now going to affect the day-to-day -day lives? Or was there a little bit of, what, what have I gotten myself into here? <laughs> what was the initial thought after the check mark appeared beside your name and you were declared the elected counselor? Yeah, I think, <laughs> again, back to all the butterflies. I, once I, I remember hearing that, I was blown away, super excited. And I was actually, maybe this is me being so green. I was just really excited to get in there and start. Like, I was like, okay, it's happening. I knew that it was going to be a quick transition. Um, and so at that point, I was really ready to, to sink my teeth in. But I remember a couple of days later after the election, um, it was actually, my, it was my birthday. And I had taken some of my girlfriends out to a local Okotoks place. And then we were sitting there having fun it was bingo and someone had come up to me and like whispered in my ear like congratulations I voted for you and then I was like oh you know what I mean and then I realized that like it's real like someone I don't even know that person had walked up to me and said that I'm like hey real life it's happening now correct me if I'm wrong here and yeah you know Okotoks better than I do but Okotoks counselors are elected at an at-large uh basis right it's not a ward system like here in Calgary correct correct at large yeah so in the scale of your counselors, do you know where you fell? Were you the top three, top two, first candidate, like number one elected counselor? What, where did you fall if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, no, that's fine. I was, I came in fourth and it was the, the, the votes were pretty close between um, six, seven, six, five, four. Yeah. So you, you are an elected official. You have... You, you know the policy is going to be coming. You know that budget's going to be coming. You know that uh, as a, an elected official, you are going to be making decisions based on everyone. You look back on the last year now. Mm -hmm. Was it a education in uh, politics that you were not expecting? Or was it an easy transition from being an outsider into the political realm? It was not an easy transition. It was, and when I say it wasn't easy, it was a huge learning curve, huge. And what I found challenging, this is what people, when they ask me, how was your first year? I, my answer usually is like, imagine starting a new job, a really challenging one. And it's like, you're in a fishbowl and everybody's watching. Right. And in these smaller communities, yes, Okotoks is 30,000 people, but in these smaller communities, people, you go to the gym or you go to the park or you pick your kids up from school and you know a lot of the people there. And then so to learn as we go and to make decisions that might not have made everyone happy 
and then see those people on a day-to-day -day basis was a really big learning curve for me, for sure. Because then all of a sudden my town, the way I interacted with my town or the way that I went out was a little bit different too, right? I obviously, I make this joke too, I'm a pretty casual person, um, but I couldn't necessarily go to after school pickup anymore in like my rattiest sweatpants, right? You know, like it kind of, you get, you, it's like a different level now. So um, it wasn't an easy transition. I enjoyed it. Um, I learned a lot, but it, uh, yeah, it's like learning in a fishbowl is what I would say. What, what advice would you have given yourself then if you knew what you knew now? You know, I would say, and I, I, that people, people have busy lives. They have a lot going on and yes, they might care in the moment that it is when a decision is made, but really when you are going to the gym, you're out in the community. It's a lot of it's in our head. I think as politicians, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's in your head. They're, they're just, they're trying to live their lives. And yeah, there are the folks that are, are really upset and they, they want to tell you and that's fine, but for the most part, it was more in my head. So if I did it all over again, or I would tell new politicians, I would say, um, you know, it's just, yeah, don't go too much in your in your head about it. People care, but not everyone is has enough time to care that much, right? Yeah. Understandable. Yeah. I want to turn to the community now because we talked about yourself and who you are, but I want to turn to your community. You mentioned a few things uh, uh, about before you were elected, you wanted to help change and put a draft policies around transit, affordability, the COVID-19 pandemic, the aftermaths. Um, in your first year, you've had to tackle a lot of these challenges, particularly with COVID-19, and we're dealing with the aftermaths now. Um, what has been the biggest, biggest focus for you as a counselor for the uh, town's perspective to deal with in your first uh, year in office? I think our, this entire year has been working towards the strategic plan. So all the issues that you're that you're mentioning, transit, affordable housing, recovering from COVID-19, connecting our communities, those have all are all in our on all our plates, all the counselors' plates. And this past year has been working on making sure that our strategic plan includes those. And I'm really excited. It's going to be finalized at our next council meeting. And so um, there, it's it was a year of ensuring that what people told us in the election made it onto the strategic plan, that our strategic plan is actually deliverable, that our administration can do it. Um, and then we're going to finalize it. So that was, I would say, the focus. Lots of other stuff happened. But we know, and our administration has been really great on that, that a really good strategic plan can really help carry a community forward. And how does how does your vision because you ran and all your fellow counselors and the mayor of Okotoks all ran on different platforms you all didn't agree on 100% of the issues. So that strategic plan is a, a, a document that a lot of municipalities are doing right now, particularly in Alberta, other uh, uh, provinces are going through the same process as well right now but for you working with your fellow counselors to create a strategic plan that will benefit the community but also benefit the community for years to come was it a challenge to get all the minds together or was it a easy process because I can imagine putting seven people of different opposing views in a room is not going to be a fun time but council seems to always have a way to come out the other side in a cohesive message. 100%. And I think that is the most, one of the coolest things that I've learned from this past year is that there are seven people at that table and we all love our community and we really all want to serve. Maybe the way that we serve and the policies are different, but at the end of the day, we love our residents and we want to make this a better place. And so when we were talking about our different policies that we wanted to put forward, definitely we had to tweak some, but I actually feel that everyone, what they ran on and the different groups that kind of um, supported each candidate. I like, I'm looking at the strat plan right now. I feel that 
everyone had a chance to put what's important to them. And what I think is really cool, Chris, too, is that there are parts of the strat plan. For example, we have someone on council that's really connected with the business community, right? So a lot of feedback, spurring economic development. That's not my strong suit. Like I understand, I really understand the value of a strong local economy, but there are folks on council that that is their, you know, that's the wheelhouse, that's their connections all the time. And that made it onto here. And I'm just really, really happy about that because um, that is a key part that wasn't necessarily my platform, but I feel really, really enhances uh, the, the strategic plan, if that makes sense. You know, it does. But what was your yeah. focus then? Because yeah. we talk about the other counselor who was yes. focused on the business community. Where was your uh, focus that you brought into the strategic plan that you said, okay, no matter what, I need this in because I think this will benefit the community. And I be heard it at the doorsteps when I was knocking in the 2021 election. So what was your focus when you were going through this process of the strategic plan for uh, the town of Okotoks? Yeah, so there were a couple of things that I really pushed hard for and made it on there. And I'm, I'm so happy that they're going to be moving forward on this. And so one of them is it's kind of all along the economics, but it's making arts and culture as an economic driver. So I heard a lot from the artist community um, in my campaign and also my you know, I'm from an artist community like my mom is a, is an artist. And, you know, that's a lot of the way that in the early days that anyways, it doesn't matter, but she, um, she was an artist and it is a part of me as well. And so I understand too, that when we recover from COVID-19 and we, if we want to get economic um, growth going, arts and culture is a really important part of that. And so that made it onto our strong local economy is using arts and culture as an economic driver, which has so many benefits. So I'm really happy about that. Another one too, is that um, I heard this throughout the community is that we really need to ensure that um, we are continuing our work with truth and reconciliation. So really making that a priority using the TRC calls to action as a guiding document. Um, and that, you know, the town was working on that before, but now we've kind of, again, made it a priority. So we're going to really be ensuring that that gets moved forward as well. Um, another one too, that I'm super excited about is that in the last term, the council did amazing work with policies. They made the climate action plan, which is, 100%. It's fantastic. So we made it a priority in this strat plan to focus on that, right? Because I've heard some of the other guests say, you can make the most beautiful policies, the most beautiful documents, but if they're sitting on a shelf, what's the point, right? So I, that's something I really wanted to ensure that we, we bring that document out and then we follow it through because it's important. Well, hello, this is your friendly host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with Strategic Steps Incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the news show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into The Political Trenches. So uh, you, you took the words out of my mouth for the next question. How is this document? Because you, you said it's going to be uh, passed at your next council meeting. I'm assuming that was in September because this is airing in October. I could be wrong or it could be. Uh, Correct. It, it, yeah. So it, it will have been passed by now, hypothetically, uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances, but uh, it will be passed. How will this document change your way of thinking when it comes to addressing issues that are before council? Will you always be looking at this document in the back of your mind? Because you said it best. I've had past guests on this show who have said, a document is great. It can look pretty, but if you don't look at it every few days, it's just a document that's going to sit on the shelf. So how are you going to ensure that what is passed at the council meeting and the strategic plan is used in making the decisions that are best for Okotoks? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's probably one of the most valuable things that I've learned. And I think that councils need to do is that we have a finite resource bank. So not only in administration, but also in finances. And so this document that I'm holding <laughs> really will help us keep things so that we don't go all over the place. So if we have 
so it, it keeps us focused on what is important. Now, the tricky thing, you have seven people. And so that means that there's so many people talking to those seven different counselors. It's really easy. And this, I've gotten stuck in this is something I'm working on. People come to me, they're like, we want this changed. We want a bylaw on this. It's really important to them. But if I decide to make a motion on it and it's not in the strategic plan and it's going to take administration X amount of time, if it's a bylaw, it might require more municipal enforcement dollars, then then we're just we're not focused on what we had planned. And now we have we're ballooning our 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 costs. Right. And so it, I think it'll help me personally as a counselor when folks come to me and say that, you know, they want this change if it's not in the strategic plan. We have to be very careful if we want to use administration's time and taxpayer dollars to implement it. So did you hear that a lot? Did you hear that a lot at the door? Where uh, and I could be wrong here, and please correct me if I am, um, because I've heard it from other municipalities, and I used to work in municipality, and yeah. I heard this a lot. Was uh, sometimes council can have pet projects, and they can go off on a tangent and bring in things that cost more, even though it's not with the strategic plan. And let's be honest, I think I could say this with the all truth. Not a lot of people know what a strategic plan is. I think that not a lot of residents would know where their strategic plan for their community is or what's involved in creating a strategic plan. Do you think the document, a, a strategic plan document gets forgotten a lot? And during the last municipal election, did you hear, we need a plan to move forward. We can't be just being reactive to all these issues. We have to start being proactive on the issues that are facing our community. Yeah, I, I, people definitely want to plan going forward because Okotoks is in a really interesting place for growth, for sure. I didn't necessarily hear as much that things were kind of piecemeal put together because the town, honestly, I stepped into an, like an incredible administration where they've had strategic plans before I came in, right? So they've kind of always had those guiding documents, but I can definitely appreciate um, the, the challenge of balancing um, the, you know, when groups come to you um, with the strategic plan. And I think that with residents too, there is something that is on my table that I think, uh, you know, it's going to be a hard conversation that, but it, it's, it's some way that I can explain myself saying, look, I really appreciate the concern that you brought to me. I understand it's important to you. It's still on my radar, but at this time, we're not able to, you know, um, put resources towards it, right? And I think it then folks understand that it's not that we don't want to do it. It's just that it, it isn't a priority from one to 10, right? Maybe it's an 11. Um, again, it's on our radar, but we just were not able to do everything, which is hard. It's it so is hard. hard because you want to make everyone happy, right? But at the of same course. time, you have to make the tough decisions. Hence why you were elected. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, though, that's the caveat to a lot of people getting elected. It's like, oh, now I have to tell people no sometimes. And that's probably the hardest part of the last year for you is because, and I've only known you for, well, let's be honest, a half hour in our brief conversations on social media you seem like a very bubbly personality and you seem like you're very, not people pleaser, but you seem like you want the best for your community. Is it hard to say no to people and say, not like officially N-O, but while we would love to help you right now, we need to focus on X, Y, and Z because these are the issues that we're facing. That's facing the town as a whole instead of just this one street or this one cul-de-sac. Oh, Chris, a hundred percent. Like <laughs> this, like in my heart, like I'm definitely like a recovering people pleaser. Like it's something you totally caught it. And I think in, in politics, it's a really fine line between um, people pleasing and then making those hard decisions. And I have learned it in this year and I have had to say, I'm sorry. Like, again, I understand your concern right now. It's not a priority. I know it's important to you, but I'm, we're not able to do it. And it, you know, it just, it really, it, in the beginning, it really, I came home at the end of the day and I'm like, what is happening? And I, and the reason is this too, too, I think people have a misconception too. We are elected officials. We do work for the people and their voices. That's what we are listening to. But I think as new counselors, we also, I have the misconception that what people say is what I'm going to do. And that's not necessarily always the case because what folks want to see happen may not be feasible, right? And so there, there's a huge jump from being outside of politics to going into politics. And it was a very steep learning curve for me. I'm still learning it. 
And I hope that by the end of the four years, um, it won't hurt my heart so much when I have to say no, but I think I'll, I think I'll hopefully get through it. <laughs> How do you balance that? How do you balance your need for the one-on-one personal connection with your voters compared to the larger picture of the town of Okotoks? Because I, I've sat down with council candidates and ca- uh, councillors from across the province, and mm-hmm. I've asked them the question: How do you? How do you? how do you always look at the bigger picture? Because sometimes you have to look at the smaller picture. You, sometimes you have to think, okay, while it doesn't benefit everyone, that water main that's under Ruth Ann's uh, house right now needs to be replaced or it could cause a bigger issue. And it needs to be fixed now instead of maybe putting in a brand new pavement street in this area. How do you balance that? Because you have to pick, you have to be picking, you have to be like, there has to be winners and losers in politics in general. And as a municipal council, as the frontline government, the one that people deal with on a regular basis, you are choosing who the winners and losers are. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that what, it's a hard balance for sure. But what I have learned is this, Chris, is that if you're upfront with people and you tell them, unfortunately, at this time, we're not able to you know, put in a uh, traffic light at that point, you know, Um, if you're upfront with the reasons why saying, well, there, we have a traffic study and we have these priorities are ranked higher danger intersections. This intersection is here. Like if you explain to people, for the most part, people are like, yeah, I'm not happy with that, but I I appreciate you telling me. Do they understand? Do they understand where you're trying to come from? Because I I, I love your answer there, uh, counselor, and I appreciate your honest answer there because I always find it interesting when counselors say that because if you tell people the truth, people will accept it, right? And I I just want to make sure that are people actually saying to you, while I don't like this decision, I understand right now it's not the benefit, but please make it a priority for us. A hundred percent. And we just sat in a meeting about that. And I've learned this too. Our mayor is, um, she's been in politics. Former guest of the show. (laughs) Oh yeah. A former guest of the show as well. Mayor Thorne. And two, it was, it was a meeting about a user group that wanted to see something changed. And she was very honest with them too. She said, at this time, you know, we understand your concerns. We're not able to make that change implemented. And the, and the resident said, look, I'm not happy with that answer, but I understand. And I just had a resident talk to me too about, um, something to do with pathways. And I explained, you know, right now, I know when we look at our priority for council, this specific issue is not a priority. It's not a priority of the, you know, the counties beside us. So we don't have it on the table. Doesn't mean it won't be in the future. It's not on the table. And he said, look, thanks for letting me know. Now I don't think that it's going to be like that his hopes weren't, you know, high that it was going to get moved forward. Right. So I don't know. So far, the response has been um, good. It, you know, they just say, you know, I'm not happy with it, but I understand why you made it. Yeah. I want to turn to the future because we always like talking about the future Mm -hmm. on the show. And I want to know from you, and this is you, this is not the town. This is not anyone else. This is counselor, Rachel Swinseed and Chris Brown talking right now. What do you think is the biggest challenge this town of Okotoks has Okotoks, sorry, has Mm -hmm. in the next year? The biggest challenge that we have is that we are set to grow. We are growing, but we are set to grow um, into our annex boundaries. The, the biggest challenge we're going to have is that what people hold very dear in Ogotoks is a small town feel. It's, I get it, I'm from here. I love that small town feel. That's why I'm raising my kids here. So the biggest challenge we're going to have is ensuring that all the policies and all the stuff that we're about to do in the next year helps keep that small town feel, helps residents and inf- keep, keep them informed of the change. Make sure that that growth that's in the future is uh, sustainable. It's in- like it's intelligent growth. So yeah, that's, that's my answer is that the biggest in the next year is um, ensuring that the growth that we have projected um, we are planning properly for it. To harken back to our last segment there about the strategic plan, do you think the strategic plan addresses your, your 
your concern about the growth that's going to be coming to the t- uh, the town of Okotoks because uh, that seems like a very big issue that you have to undertake here is growth is good growth is always yeah. good but growth in a small community where people want the small community feel yeah. is hard because you want to balance the need for growth but also the need for people to still feel the way they feel about their community for sure and i do feel the strategic plan does meet that because you know in that plan we wrote a lot about keeping folks connected we wrote people are worried about climate change like if we focus on the climate change action plan that means that those communities that are going to be built are going to be following that plan so that we are ready for a climate change you know adaptation um it looks at you know like a strong local economy it looks at affordable housing i think folks have a, and i understand their point of view when growth can be scary but also growth allows opportunities for example, we have a really big affordable housing problem in Okotoks. We've never grown and all of a sudden we're growing and we need more affordable housing. Growth allows more affordable housing opportunities and that's in our strategic plan. So I do, if we use that as a guiding document, I think that we will be set. Um, As long as we can continue to talk with residents, let them know and have them walk alongside us as we grow. And how do you do that? How do you bring a community along? Because you are a council of seven. How do you bring them along with you? Because you're going to have people who are not happy. <laughs> Let's mm-hmm. be honest. You've, mm-hmm. you've mentioned that beforehand. How do you bring them along? How do you bring the community as a whole together to ensure that the vision that you are setting out addresses what they want as well? Yeah, I think it just goes down to communication. Honestly, Chris, it's just keeping folks informed keeping um, them knowing like what, you know, what's happening, what's going on, ensuring that we're listening to the voices uh, so they have a say and what, you know, what that development looks like in the future. Um, I know this council, we really want to be on the ground. Like we really want to be involved through social media, through like events that we do through town where we do like pop You guys have events. done a really good job. Sorry to interrupt, councillor, but you yeah. guys are really doing a good job because again, I follow most of the councillors yeah. in this province, but it seems like Okotoks taking it a step further with like you guys were at parades, you guys have events like coffee dates where people can come mm-hmm. chat with like councillors. It seems like you yeah. guys are really in the whole uh, mindset that engage with your citizens, not just because it's an election, but outside of an election day, day, year. Yeah, a hundred percent, Chris. And I think that that's just, the more that you engage with residents and you let them know what's happening, informing them, keeping them as part of the process, like this is their community. In the long run, the more successful you will be in, in achieving these goals, because if folks feel like they are part of the process, um, then when you get to the end stage, they can see them, they can see how it happened and why. Um, I also really believe too, this council has been great on that we really want to make politics accessible in the sense that we all are just like regular Okotoks people, right? And so we want folks to know that, that we are not way up here in like some palace or whatever. We're like taking our kids to school or we're like cutting hair, you know what I mean? And we, we want folks to know that we're citizens that just want to hear yours and make policies on that. <laughs> you, you you brought up a good point and I want to sort of jump into that mm-hmm. sandbox with you for a second, if you're okay sure. with that. And that is balancing work and life. And I, have, I should have asked this earlier, but I wasn't going to, but you brought it up. How do you balance mm-hmm. that? Because as a city councillor, a town councillor, you are at the grocery store where your voters are, where your electorates are, and in a community like Okotoks, people know who you are, and they will stop you on a regular basis, I'm assuming, and ask you questions and talk to you about certain uh, staff ish or municipal mm-hmm. issues. Mm-hmm. How do you balance your work and family life? Yeah, so I, I committed to my family, even in my campaign that during the campaign and if successful that they would not become a back burner if i was successful and during the campaign so i made that commitment beforehand and so there's certain certain things i do in my life that um i are just like non-negotiables to me you know things like not checking my work email when i'm with my kids um things like really trying to plan around my kids schedule so that i can be home with them at the end of the day right um now but there's it's hard when you're out in the community like you said folks know you and they want to come up to you i think the uh something not lucky that i have is that i have two young kids so they're with me usually a lot of the time and so people have been very kind right if they've ever 
right? You know, it's like, I, I don't know if it's because my kids are there and they don't want to like get into like a thing. Um, with that being said, I've had, we've been out of this where people have come up to me and they've kind of um, really provided their feedback and it was really kind of intense and my kids weren't with me. Right. And so that's a totally different thing. I think if my kids aren't with me and we're at an event, I'm happy to, you know, really get into it. Um, but, um, that work-life balance, I, it's something that honestly, if there's something I'm, one thing I'm proud of from this year is, um, really kind of keeping that and like non-negotiable, like, uh, my, you know, my family and my kids, they need to come first because at the end of the day, four years, my, like after four years, if I decide not to run again, my family's still here, but politics isn't, right? Yeah. So if I kind of mess things up with my friends and my family, what happens after those four years? So um, yeah, it's been a challenge, but it's something I knew was going to happen. So I just kind of gave myself the tools. Back, steering back to the original conversation about yeah. the town of Okotoks, we talked about what the biggest challenge you believe is in the first year. What about mm -hmm. five years from now? So take yourself and put yourself into next term. So four years later, you potentially run for re-election. You may, may not run for re-election. If you were to accomplish everything you wanted to accomplish in the first year, first term, what would you believe is the next terms council's uh, big priority? Because your priority right now, it sounds like transit, affordability, housing, uh, arts and culture, truth and reconciliation, climate action. What's next? What's the next terms council going to have to deal with? Well, if, if right now is any indicator on the future, we're obviously dealing financial considerations are a challenge now. And I can't imagine that things will get more inexpensive in the future. <laughs> what? 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 Counselor, yeah. how, what? <laughs> you know. Breaking news, things won't get cheaper. <laughs> cheaper, yep. <laughs> so um, I think, again, we're trying to balance that now, but I can't, again, in the, I can't imagine in the future it's going to be any easier. And also um, with that is, is um, and growth, not necessarily in Okotoks, but growth in Alberta and in specifically in the Calgary region, I think is going to, how do we all work together as partners? And it's important now, and it's going to be important in the future because we have limited financial resources. We have a limited, when I say land, because I, I really strongly believe in regional planning. So how do we best use those resources um, on a limited land base for like future success. So I would say again, planning and then finances. How do municipalities find extra revenue streams? Like how, you know, this roller coaster. So yeah. Um, I wanna ask you a poignant question. And this is the yeah. million dollar question that's gonna start wrapping this, uh, sh uh, this episode up here, <laughs> counselor. What makes the town of Okotoks so unique? I love this question. Um, <laughs> what makes the town of Okotoks so unique, and I brought it up before, is its small town feel. We are 30,000 people, but folks tell me, and I'm witness to it, you go out and you still see people that you know, you talk to people. It has this beautiful community vibe to it. We have events all the time. We have pathways that connect all of the communities, um, and it's just an incredible, it's yeah, it's an incredible connected community. And um, I think that's what makes it really unique. I think the challenges as communities grow, sometimes you can lose that. And I feel at 30,000, we've kept it. And hopefully with proper planning, following the strap plan, we can continue to keep it going into the future. And I'm going to say one more thing too. Um, we are have an amazing pathway system and an amazing river valley and a beautiful baseball stadium. So there's a number of things to do in Okotoks. Well, you just like just took my Latinx question out of the uh, the, the the hat there. Um, I'm a tourist coming through Okotoks. What are a few stops that you would suggest to a tourist coming to your community that mm -hmm. is the pinnacle stops that they need to do while in the community? Sure. I the what I would recommend is first you'll go downtown during an event. Because again, people love our events here. You're going to come on a Saturday. You're going to come in the summer. You're going to explore the small shops down there. You're going to have, a, you know, eat some food from a local restaurant. Fantastic. Then you're going to go see some local art galleries, which are downtown. 
And then after that, I always suggest um, moving on to into the river valley, which flows through Okotoks, right? We've got beautiful pathways. Um, it's just stunning down there. And then I would finish off the night with going to the base, a baseball game at the dog stadium um, and, you know, watch the sunset, have some popcorn, cheer on the dogs. So those are three, when I have folks ask me that question, I tell them those same things, go downtown, go to the river valley, go to the dog stadium. And then my last question to you is this. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite part of the community? You mean like geographically? Or anything. Or is it a certain restaurant? Is it a park? Is it the riverfront? What is your favorite part of the community? Yeah, my favorite part, I think, and it hit me during COVID, is I live in a place in Okotoks here where my kids and I, we can walk by a splash park, we walk down a path, and then there's a little ice cream store downtown. That and also too, that during COVID made me realize policies change people's lives because that pathway was put in by previous councils to connect downtown to this community. And so all we did during COVID was walk down that path and get ice cream because there's nothing else to do. And so that right now that holds a special place in my heart. <laughs> Well, Councillor Rachel Swenson, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure, and it's a great way to kick off our month-long series on municipal issues, but also municipal governments as well and municipal councillors. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy morning to do this, to sit down with us and to have a conversation. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it, Chris. Thank you so much. So with that, as I remind all my uh, listeners and viewers as well, put down your social media Go have a conversation with somebody. It helps her democracy, helps her society, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.